Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to Calvary Baptist Church. And it is good to see you tonight. And uh, good to have Brother Wally, although it looks like everybody's trying to avoid you here. Look, look at them all. <laughs> well, that's good. Maybe it's the beard you're scared of. We'll see Miss Wessel. She'll, she'll help you out. Now, it, it is good to be here. It's good to have Brother Wally here tonight. And, and uh, we've been praying for you. And uh, glad to always hear good updates from you. And uh, glad you're back in the area. Of course, he's going to be uh, looking to move uh, Western Virginia. Um, but uh, glad you could be with us here for a little bit. And uh, so it's good to have you tonight. Uh, let's just mention a, just a couple of, of uh, announcements as we get started this evening. I don't want to go through everything again. Uh, we do have the activities board set up. Don't forget, we do need the volunteers still for the Fall Family Festival end of the month and, uh, and some candy for that as well. And so if you could help us out with that, I know that you're looking forward to that as well. Uh, we'll get that taken care of. And then th this week, of course, Tuesday night, our prayer meeting, 7 o'clock here in the auditorium. And Wednesday night's midweek service coming up. Looking forward to those things. I want to shorten some things tonight because we do, uh, with the weather turning the way it is, just kind of we'll uh, get you out a little bit sooner maybe than we normally do. Uh, we'll we'll uh, have one song here and a couple of things and missionary letters that's in the special and then um, and then we'll get right into the lesson tonight. So let's get started in our, with our song, hymn number fifty-five. If you want to turn there, fifty-five. As you'll stand with me as we sing at the cross, at the cross, fifty-five. We'll sing all four verses tonight. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. We're on hymn 55 on the second verse. Was it for crimes that I have done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. Cross at the cross where I first saw the light, burden of my heart. It was there by faith I received my sight. And now I am happy all the day. Well might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in. When Christ the mighty maker died for man the creature sin. At the cross, at the cross, rolled away it was there by grace i received my sight and now i am happy all the day but drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love i owe dear lord i give myself away Tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Amen. I'm going to ask Brother Wally if you wouldn't mind opening us in prayer tonight. Amen. You may be seated. Well, like I said, we are shortening things just a little bit here, and uh, and so uh, but we do want to keep those important things going. So we, of course, Sunday nights, 
uh, take time to get an update from a missionary. And uh, so Miss Natalia Jarvis is going to come up and give us that report and then prayer for those missionaries. from the day cares who are in the Fiji Islands. Um, there was nothing new on Facebook other than a missionary family had visited them. Um, so this is actually from June and July. And in May, Miss Deku, Miss Francis, actually had a stillborn and um, little Miriam. And um, however, her mom and her aunt were able to come out and visit and get some time with her and just help her through that time. And actually on Facebook, she gave a really good um, testimony throughout that time and just um, how God led her through. And um, so if you're on Facebook and you go to the Day Cruise page, you can listen to it. It's just a few minutes long. Um, but she definitely, um, she got some healing, and I, I know that's a long road in the future. Um, they also had a Bible conference there, and I think that was in June, it said. And now they're re resuming back to their normal ministries. Um, there, a container came that had a lot of their supplies, so they're very grateful and thankful that it cleared customs. Um, as well as they are looking to see if the Lord will open doors for them to start a school. There are some hurdles. They don't list specifically what they are, but they're asking for prayer um, to get that school started. Um, and then they had a annual youth camp in July, and there's no update how that went that I could see. Um, so that would have been passed, so I'm sure God worked great miracles in that situation there was a gentleman on their facebook page that they were praying for that they had to have emergency um, appendix surgery appendix appendectomy and that went really well for them um so tonight when i go to pray i'm going to be praying for as i can see right now just that their ministry continues and that if their school is in god's will that that's what they um are able to open up all right so i'm going to pray Dear Heavenly Gracious Father, Lord, we thank you so much for those who have answered your call to the mission field. We thank you that they have a heart to go out, um, sometimes far away from their home, their families, and to teach and preach the gospel, Lord. We want to lift up the day coups, uh, Miss Francis, as she still continues to heal and um, go forward from having the little Miriam, Lord, who's um, born, still born, Lord. May you just continue to heal her heart and help her to um, lean on you and, and to grow in you. Continue to bless their two other children, Lord, and their family as they serve you, Lord. And Father, this school that they're hoping and um, they're asking, Lord, for guidance with opening, Lord, that would you just help them to uh, seek your will and to get through these hurdles that they have to get through. We know if it's in your will, it's going to happen, Lord. Give them the patience. Give them the um, desire, Lord, just to follow you in that path. Lord, we also just thank you for the Bible conference that they had as, as well as the youth con camp that they just had this past summer, Lord. As they continue to serve you this year, Lord, may they just see your blessings in you in their work, Lord, and that others be saved and so that you're glorified and added to your kingdom. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, and just before the lesson, we've got a special here. I'm going to get this out of the way. From the Jarvis Family Trio. Are you all going to stand on the steps over here? Okay. it's great that the sign for Abel is, it makes me want to have a big truck to drive. 
Y'all ever do that, right? You would want the truck to honk the horn. Please tell me I'm not the only one. All right, thank you, thank you. I don't know if they still do that. Maybe they do. He is able, though. All right, we are continuing our lessons tonight on the New Testament church. If you're following along in the book, it's lesson six, which means technically sort of, kind of, we're halfway, uh, which is unbelievable. I feel like the semester just started. Structure of the New Testament church is our lesson tonight. Lesson six, the structure of the New Testament church. So we've, of course, talked, we're focusing on that first century church, not because they hold, again, any kind of authority over us, not because there's some kind of special church in the sense that, uh, that they uh, descend to us power from them, but they are a great example, and the scriptures uses them as we read about them in Acts as a great example of, of what we can be and what we should be doing as a church. Uh, and so we learn a lot from them. And it's good to focus on this because some people are focusing towards the modern church. What do we do to make things modern and appealing to people today and uh, try to uh, do things in a, in, in a, with, with worldly philosophy in mind is, and trying to make updates in that sense? We don't want to fall behind in certain things. I'm glad that we have the technology that we do. I'm glad we can live stream uh, and uh, so that people can watch in places that they wouldn't necessarily have been able to before they'll receive the gospel in their home where they might not have before or maybe they just can't be here with us and they watch and you know technology is good uh but but the basis of what we what we're focused on what we're based on our foundation doesn't change and so uh it's a good study and uh, of course we're working out of a book written by pastor clarence sexton uh, on the becoming the first century church great book we've been reading through as we go and uh, very helpful uh, and, and our notes are kind of based off of that. But the New Testament Church, Lesson 6, the structure of the New Testament Church. And uh, let's take a look at, of course, uh, theme verses for the semester. As we've been studying the New Testament Church, there's a couple of verses especially stand out. Now tonight, I put them up here as a fill in the blank. Ooh, now you got to think about it. What is, what are the blanks here? Someone read for me Matthew 16, 18 with those blanks filled in. Anybody? What, is, what does Christ say here? Right. Yeah, I know, right? You'd think everybody would have jumped on that one. This is the easy one. I will build my church. He wasn't even here for all the other lessons. Yay. Matthew 16, 18 says, Christ is speaking, of course, longer verse than this, but the section we focused on especially where Christ says, I will build my church. All right, now it's the harder one. Maybe that's the one you're waiting on. First Corinthians 12, 18, but now hath what? Who? This is a Sunday school answer. But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the what? Not the assembly. It is the word, it is a word for that. The body. We'll get it eventually. As it hath what? Pleased him. And so God builds the church in a manner which pleases him. And there's nothing better that we could want for our church than pleasing God. He says, Christ says, I will build. You know, we sometimes we get looking around. We think, well, I'm a little concerned. I'm a little worried. Don't worry. Christ keeps his word. He said, I will build my church and it, in, in such a way that pleases God. If we supersede Christ's building of the church, we're not building in such a way that will please God. And so we're relying on him for these things. And so these are theme verses that we've been looking at as we, as we go through these chapters. I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to go ahead and uh, open us in prayer here tonight. I feel like missing that we'll go open in prayer and then we'll get started lord we thank you for this day god i thank you for uh, what you've given to us in your word and how we can structure ourselves in the manner that you tell us to lord this is where we'll find the most success in you is to structure ourselves after your your plan your purpose for us god so we pray that you'll just work in our hearts and guide us and tonight lord i pray that you'll be with uh lord just uh with just work in our hearts bless us tonight as we uh, study your word be with those who couldn't be here, God, I just pray that you'll work in a way that bring them back with us. And uh, we look forward to what you're going to do, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. All righty, so we're talking about the structure of the New Testament church. And uh, as we have been doing it in, by way of introduction, just to kind of set a question or two up for us as we study here. And, uh, and recognizing that there are attacks today on the structure of the church, how the church is built, how God is 
ordained things to be put together is under attack. No surprise there, as we've seen so many things are. But there is a de-emphasis today on the structure of the church. A de-emphasis on the structure of the church. A lot of people put structure of the church, we're talking membership, pastor-led, Jesus Christ head, uh, you know, deacon uh, uh, served and led churches, and that the structure is being de-emphasized these days. It's being said that that's old, old stuff, old thinking. It's an old way of doing things. Well, old is not always bad. Old can be good, and uh, and and so there's a de-emphasis on structure. In fact, some even deny that any structure is necessary in a church, and we see this manifested in several different ways these days. We see today satellite churches without local pastors. There, this is a big movement today. Hillsong is one of those big church movements and where they call themselves a church, but they really fall underneath of a structure where they, they may have a, a local leader, but he doesn't be, he's not the one that does the preaching. Uh, he's not really leading his flock as he's supposed to be. Uh, they, they outsource, in a sense, the preaching, the leading of God's word. And we've seen some big problems coming up today within that system because when such depends on one person and how much it fails when that one person fails uh, themselves. Uh, but this is a denial of the structure that God set up. Churches without membership. That's another big thing going on. These mega churches, they're not members joining a church and, and, uh, and committing to that church. They're coming and they're going. It's more like a, a concert where you've got tickets and you get to go and you... And you show up, and then, you, of course, you know, you're done, and you don't show up the next night again, and you come and you go as you please. It makes it easy uh, in that sense, but it's but the lack of commitments there. Church, this is a phrase more, but this uh, wraps up a philosophy. Church is wherever you are. I heard somebody actually, uh, you know, I've, always, I've seen people who practice that and kind of believe that. I had someone actually say that to me uh, in, in his defining of church and, he doesn't go to the building anymore. He doesn't go where the people are congregating because he's Christian. He's saved. He's, well, Christian, he didn't use the word saved. And so church is wherever you are because God's with you. And that's, that's not a biblical teaching. Now, we know that church isn't a building. We know it's a people. But there's an assembly and uh, some assembly required. <laughs> I'll get that later. All right. <clears throat> churches under other churches or organizations. That's something we see a lot of. And that while not denying structure itself, sets up a, the, the, it de-emphasizes the structure of, of, uh, of how God set up churches. And so churches placing themselves under or being built underneath of other organizations that control them and uh, de-emphasizing the local church structure that God had set up. And then, uh, so what does the Bible say then about the structure of the church? You know, I, you know it, it leads you to wonder why there's so many different thoughts on it why things have changed so much, what are they looking to to get the structure they're looking at? Does the Bible teach what they're doing? Does it teach what we're doing? What does the Bible say about the structure of the church? Because this is really the truth and, the, the, and really all that matters. This is the truth and really all that matters. What, what the Bible says about it. doesn't matter what you, you know, well, it makes sense to do this because, you know, we got one dynamic guy and so he's able to preach to a bunch of these different places and, and so we set it up that way because it just makes sense with it. It doesn't matter if it makes sense to you or not. It makes What does the Bible say about it? That's what makes the difference. What, is, what does it say about the structure of the church? Um, and, uh, and so this is all that really matters. So let's take a look at what the Bible has to say about the structure. Of course, we do see in scriptures a mandate for the structure of the church. Scripture is clear that there is to be a structure to church. So this, this is... Uh, some philosophies directly against the idea of structure within each person being part of that. Uh, the scripture does clearly teach it. We see, first of all, the attitude of Jesus concerning his church and the words that he would give us uh, that reflect what he said about the church, what, his, what, his, uh, what the truth is about the church. He says, like, for instance, as we saw in our, I think one of our theme verses, as he talks about, I will build my church. A building requires and denotes structure. If you're building something, there's a structure to it. Christ has said he's building up his church. If it was just people getting together and that's it, there's nothing really to build up. It's more of a just kind of a bringing people along for a moment. But Christ is talking about building his church, putting together a structure. And that's what he's promised to do. 
We see in Matthew 18, 13 to 17, where Jesus is teaching about uh, specifically church discipline. And, uh, and one of the phrases within that is tell it to the, tell them to the church. Talking about when there's a person who's, done, who's wronged and they've been approached and now they've been approached with a group and they're still not changing and they're directly against God and what they're doing and their offense. And so then it's to be told unto the church. There's a church body that's being spoken to about these things and there has to be a structured body for this. We're going to look at the idea of why that's important but later as well. But the, the structure that's the things that are being told to, report it to. We have missionaries who report to churches, to structures. And even in the Old the New Testament, we see that as well. And, uh, and so tell them to the church. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. This is, the, uh, of course, the commissioning of our, the, the mission that we have as a church. Go ye in all the world and teach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. So we see the direction for the church to go, to teach. They should be baptized and they should be teaching all the, all the different things that Christ has taught us. This is, again, um, in, uh, instruction, marching orders given to a structure, to a church, to a people. Uh, not a, again, not a building, but an organized group of people that have voluntarily separated themselves for this very service. Christ wouldn't just, he's not just saying that to some random group out there that just happens maybe to meet together every once in a while, but there's structure. So the attitude of Jesus, we see his direct teaching there. Also consider the language of the scriptures concerning the church. The very language, the words of scripture are important. God inspired not just thoughts, but he inspired the words of scripture. And so we need to look at those words that are used, Acts 2. 41 to 47. This is that passage I keep talking about that's such a great picture of what the church is supposed to be doing. All the different activities wrapped up into just a few verses. Very helpful passage. But in that, uh, at the beginning of that passage, we, people, we see people get saved, they get baptized, and then the Bible says that they're added to the church. Well, you don't add to just some random gathering of people, but you're adding to a structured thing. And here the church is being referred to, um, and, uh, and we see added to, membership added to. Colossians 1.18, when, when uh, you can see different places where we, it talks about Christ as the head of the body, and in that body is the church. Again, a structured thing. The body, and then the reference there, and we'll actually look at the metaphor closer by the end of this lesson. But uh, the body of the church is an important structure, or the body is the, the church is the body, and that denotes how the importance of that structure. Christ is the head, and there is no responsibility outside of that. If we didn't have membership, there's, there's really no level of commitment there. People do tend to come and go, and we'll talk about that quite a bit here. The word church, both times being used, and each time when you see it in Scripture, literally means a called-out assembly. So these people are people who, who've, um, who are called out by Christ. They're to be separated, and they're separated unto this assembly. And, uh, and so Christ builds his church, people, the people of the church being called out to that structure. And so, again, the language of Scripture, the teachings of Jesus, we see these things uh, clearly showing a mandate for structure of a church. What's also interesting is what's not said about the church in the New Testament. This is important to understand what, what cause so there are some things that are out there that, that we use as terms or to try to understand or we go a little bit further than Scripture does. We'd be careful about what's not said. One is that there's no reference to a national church, like a church of America or church of whatever country. There's no national church reference. Every time church is used in, in, in Scripture, it refers to a local church. Uh, uh, a body of believers, a local assembly. There's no national church. And again, this is a movement we see today quite a bit, um, even international church. Um, I remember, of course, coming through COVID lockdowns, but the uh, prominence of internet churches. Now, I'm not talking about, well, the church can't meet, so we're, we're just putting services online. I'm talking about churches that are designed to be internet only. 
In fact, I think one of them was called Online Church. That was the name of the church. They never intend to meet together. There's, there, this is, would be an international kind of... The church is local assembly. It's people who are called out to the body of Christ. There's no reference to a national church. We also don't find the term universal church in the Bible. And to be honest, I've used this term before, not really thinking about the ramifications of this language. But we don't find the term universal church in the Bible. Again, every time the Bible references churches, it's a local called out assembly. So kind of getting into that. And here's the danger, I think, of that phrase and, and using it when it's not scriptural. Perhaps this thinking has done more to encourage fluidity in church membership than any other. The idea of, of uh, universal church. Now, uh, I want to finish a couple points and talk about this a little bit more. We certainly are all part of the family of God, but we are not the same church. It does not mean that there's conflict. It doesn't mean that we can't get along and even work with other churches. Man, we ought to. We can accomplish more together. But there's still separate churches. Uh, and and it's, not to, it's not to promote rivalry. There shouldn't be rivalry. We're all working towards the same cause. But there are, you know, in our area, good grief, there's, there's uh, quite a few independent Baptist churches, good churches that preach the gospel, that we could agree with almost everything. And there's a few differences here and there. But they're all local churches. They are church bodies in themselves. We are not just one body that all acts the same. It's important that the distinction is held. Why? Scripture set it up that way. Fellowshipping between church memberships is not discouraged at all. But fidelity is important. Fidelity is that loyalty, that support that comes out of that loyalty. And that is important within a local church. And, and so, uh, you know, we respect other churches. We don't go around trying to take people from them. But, uh, but certainly we, and we work together in, in many ways. But we are separate churches. It's not just, a, not just that thought of a universal church. Now, like I said, I've used that term before in, in such a way as saying, uh, you know, all saved people are part of the body of Christ. Certainly we are part of the family of God. There's no question about that. I love that you can go like you're on vacation and you, and you stop in another church and that the, the Holy Spirit, uh, that same Holy Spirit in you is in them and you have a sweet fellowship with them and you don't even know them. Uh, the evangelist that came out this morning it, had never met him before. Um, he had a need and we were able to help him out and uh, in, in trying to find places to stay in the area and, and just and he came to church this morning and and I don't I don't know them but I know I can recognize the spirit within them and, and there's a fellowship there and we're able to meet and and uh, and get to know each other a little bit that way but we're still separate churches and that's how it is in the New Testament you see Paul you see other missionaries going from uh, church to church and preaching and and, uh, and, and working with these bodies, but they're separate. And that's the independent part of what we do. And so it's important to understand this. This is the structure that has been set up. The New Testament never refers to a universal church in such a way. The problem with trying to set up a universal church would be a, the, the, obviously the setting up of a hierarchy. And then you end up in a situation like the Catholics where one person controls the entirety of the church body. And then, and then all the dangers that come with that. So that's the mandate of the structure of the church. Uh, our next point, of course, the membership of the church. The New Testament church did have a membership. Membership is important. Now, not everybody that comes joins right away. But it's important for Christians to find a place that God would have them to join because membership's important. The New Testament church had a membership. We see in Acts 4.23, the, the phrase, the, the, the sentence, they went to their own company. This is after, I believe it was Peter and John, if I'm not mistaken, uh, had been uh, imprisoned for a little bit. They'd been questioned, they'd been threatened, and they were told not to preach the name of Christ anymore. This was the first time of the series of times that it would happen. And, uh, and so after they were released, they went to their own company and they reported about the things that happened. And so there's, uh, there's the, the phrasing, of course, their own company. They went to their church, and they reported to their church what had happened to them. And, uh, and so, you know, we see that connection made. Acts 9, 26 to 29, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. This is talking about Paul uh, after his conversion on the road to Damascus. 
understandably, a lot of Christians were quite a bit concerned about him. Maybe he was faking things and trying to work his way in so that he could, because uh, uh, he was persecuting the church at the time. And, uh, and, but, we, of course, his, he had been converted, and, and uh, we see him get support and help. But his, his goal was to join himself to the disciples. He wanted to join with their church. He wanted to be part of that church. This was very young Christian Paul who, who has a lot to learn before God will send him along to do his own work. So the membership of the New Testament church had great importance. Acts 5, 12 through 14. This is an interesting passage. Uh, the, the scripture says within here, and you can, of course, read the other verses at some point, but it says, Of the rest durst no man join himself to them. This is back again with, uh, uh, I believe it was Peter and John still. Uh, this is where they, be, after they've been released from prison, we mentioned Acts 4.23, they went out and preached the name of Christ again. And, uh, and this also is after uh, Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Ghost and they were, uh, they were uh, uh, killed for, uh, the Lord took their life for lying against the Holy Ghost and, and sinning against him. And uh, there was great fear upon the church. Uh, great reverence and respect for God, um, and they did great things for God. And in this particular passage, um, they're, they're meeting together on what's called Solomon's Porch, kind of a meeting area, uh, like the town square, if you will. And uh, this is where they were meeting to worship, and many came and joined with them. But there were some who refused to join, or they, they were afraid to join because they didn't want to be associated because they were being persecuted. These were people who decided that, that uh, the cause of Christ wasn't worth the persecution, and, uh, and, they, and they did not join themselves to them. But many did. Some didn't. See, again, it's that, that membership was there, and it meant something. It had great importance to it. It was an association. And, boy, especially in that day, because in that day, uh, if you, I'm, and I'm, I, I'm not even talking about the importance when I say especially in that day, I'm talking about the it was a big deal to, to join because if you joined this church and you associate yourself in that way, you were not only just you were cast out of society, so even by your own family, if they weren't joining with you, they, they would consider you dead to them. But also you were, you're inviting the persecution. So if you join the church, you might be persecuted, and, and a lot of them were. You're, you're going to be cast out from society and have a hard time doing business. Why would you join? Because it was that important for that association. It was that important to be part of what's going on. Being a church member involves a certain commitment. If you're going to join a church, there is a commitment to that. And a lot of that's been lost in today's society, and it's a shame that, that, it, that membership isn't looked on with the importance that it needs to be. But joining a church, uh, uh, being part of God's work, committing to it. It's easy just to come. And, and of course, there's a time when you, when you come to a church. And I remember I've, I've, I've been to a couple different churches as we've moved. Uh, moved up to Connecticut, went to a church up there. Uh, used to go to a different church when I was a kid. And, you know, there's a time where you visit. And you want to make sure this is what God has for us. And, and so you're, you're part of the church. You see what, you know, what are they doing for God? And what, what, what is it that I'll be able to do with them? Uh, the member, the membership look sometimes is a bit off. Uh, people will all, all seem to be asking these days, what can they do for me? What, what do I get out of it? We ought to be looking at more like it, like it's a job interview, saying, hey, this is what I can do. Uh, how can I, how can I fit in with you guys? What is it that I can contribute? And uh, and finding what God has for a person. People today more treat it like they're trying to hire the church for them. All right, well, what do you have to offer? What do you, what do you want to give to me? You know, and let me list off the things and. And it's just a weird look that we have these days. But there is commitment there, and uh, that's a good thing. Good thing to commit ourselves to the cause of Christ through the avenue that he has given to us to do. 1 Corinthians 5, 9-13. I actually want to turn to this one. There's a couple words here, without and within, that really will show us the idea of the membership in the New Testament church. Again, it's important to have this foundation to understand. Membership is not just some construct that we did. And they, it was abused uh, early, early um, this would be before 1776 in the U.S. were colonies still. The, there's established churches in, actually in states 
Uh, I don't know if you know that or not. In our history as a, as a country, and this is, of course, before we were organized ourselves, uh, there were established churches and states. And in fact, you could not vote if you weren't a church member. And so they were letting people into the church, whoever, uh, wanted to be so that they, of course, could vote and have other privileges within society. And uh, that led to some severe problems and a watered-down church and paved the way for the Great Awakening. But anyway, all that aside, um, uh, it's not some construct that we came up with. It is New Testament. So 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and looking at verse 9. The Bible says here, I wrote unto you an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of the world or with the covetousness or extortioners or with idolaters, for, for then must ye needs go out of the world. So from that point, here's what, here's what Paul is talking about to this church in Corinth. He says, you know, I wrote that you should not keep company with fornicators. Right? There's, there's the people who are outwardly sinners. Uh, I mean, this is their lifestyle. We, we, you know, we, we want to be careful. If, as we associate with people that, that we would not only be exposed to that sin, but where our testimony might be hurt. But he's saying it's not that you should never associate with them at all. He says that not yet, yet not altogether uh, with the fornicators of this world, with the, you know, all these different types of people. For then must he needs go out of the world. You know, there are people who take that step, who, who go take themselves out of the world. The, the, the Amish community, for instance, completely tries to separate themselves, cut off themselves from the outside world so that they can live within their religion and their teachings independently and, and without any kind of outward influence. And while that might keep their religion in that sense pure in, the, in how they would teach it, uh, which it doesn't actually even really accomplish that, but, it, but if you might accomplish that, but it will not make any kind of impact or difference. I mean, I'm not saying they don't make some great quilts um, or they have this ding store that I love, but... Uh, you go and they have discount groceries. Anyway, I don't know why I'm going off that. But um, but they're not making, of course, they're not making a difference to the cause of Christ. If we cut, we can't cut ourselves off from people, but there is supposed to be a separation. So he's saying, you know, I wrote for you to not keep this company, but not not in the sense that you altogether don't keep it, because it says in the verse ten, for then must he needs go out of the world. God's got us here for a reason. He wants us to reach these types of people for Christ. He wants us to give the gospel. It's not that there's no association. Look at verse 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or a covetousness or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one known not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without God judgeth uh, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So he's saying, you know, look, if, if, you're, if you were never to have any kind of contact with those kind of people, you'd be out of this world. You wouldn't need to be in this world any longer. And God could do that. You could get saved, and God could immediately take you up into heaven, and you're not around any more of these types of these people. Basically, we're just talking about sinners um, who, who are un, unrepentant sinners, right? And, uh, and so he could take us out, but he left us here to have some kind of contact with them so that we can share the good news of the gospel. We can tell them that Jesus has died to save them from their sins, that we once were the same living in sin, but Christ changed our life. He changed our heart. We repented of that sin. We repented of that way that we were headed, and we followed after Christ has said. We followed and obeyed him and, and asked Jesus to save us, and we, we can share that message with them. But, he says in verse 11, though, he's still saying not to keep that company. In other words, we have contact. We want to reach those kind of people, but they're not to be part of our congregation. They're not to be part of our assembly. And, of course, you can even see in Matthew where, how to approach and, and the need to have, sometimes have to remove somebody from membership. And so he's saying you, 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 the, the, you don't want to, to have them within the company, within the church, within the membership, not even to eat and associate with them in that way. If, and it's specifically talking about if any man that is called a brother be involved in these things, and this is what their life is. And it's like it's not saying if they, they, they sin, they're repentant, they won't make things, and they want to make it right, they're fine to keep in. But these are people who are unrepentant of what they're doing. They're supposed to be Christians, but they're not acting anything like a Christian. And the Bible says not even to eat with them. 
But look, look at the reasoning here. Verse 12, for what have I to do to judge them also that are without? It's not our place to have to judge the world. The world's already judged. Sinners already judged. Their sin has done that in their, in, on them already. God will judge them that are without, but do, do not ye judge them that are within? So we have a responsibility within membership to, to encourage each other, to uh, exhort and edify each other, to build each other up. We have that responsibility. And at times, we have to make some judgment calls. We may have to say to somebody, look, you know, they're a member of the church. You're practicing open sin. You will not repent. You're, you're shaming the name of Christ. You're causing a, a problem with the testimony of Christ. And we, have, we may have to ask or, you know, you know the kind of ask where you're telling them to leave. Uh, you know, that's possible. Now, this is, this is within membership. And even within our church, we understand the difference here. I hope we do at least, um, and I think we do. Uh, you know, we, we welcome anybody to come visit the church. Anybody come sit in a service as long as they don't disrupt. You know, we, we, we want people who are unsaved to come hear the gospel. And uh, this is a place, I hope and pray, will always be a place that, that will we'll give out the gospel every time we open the doors. That, that is what we're about. That in some way we will share that message with others. Um, and, uh, and so we want people to come. And uh, we're not kicking people out unless they cause a problem, which they need to. But membership's a different thing. Membership is for the saved, baptized believers uh, who want to follow God, who want to have a heart to follow God. And so there is a difference between someone just coming and, and then someone with joining. There, there, the Bible refers to it says without and within. Uh, in these passages, we don't, we don't judge those who are without. Their sin has judged them already, but we do have a responsibility for those within. And uh, we've got to make sure that the testimony of Christ is, is protected. The testimony of Christ is no more powerful than the testimony of his church. And so a church that doesn't um, exhort and edify and, and uh, the, its own membership, each other, ourselves, a church that does not do that uh, may lose its testimony and will harm the testimony of Christ. Because the world can't see Christ except to see the church and to see his people and to see Christ in us. Because the world does not understand spiritual things. Now, the Holy Spirit can work in a person's heart and has to, and, and, and to, to, to uh, draw them to Christ. But the, the testimony of Christ is no more powerful than the testimony of his church. And so the membership is important. It is important for Christians to be a member, to be an active member, to participate, to be part of what Christ is doing. Now, the Bible uses several different metaphors that emphasize the structure of the church in different ways. And there's three that we're going to look at here tonight uh, as we close, as we get towards the end of our notes here this evening. The first is the body of Christ. And we're very familiar with this one. Months ago, I preached a series of messages on the body of Christ and the members thereof as we as we studied uh, even Baptist doctrine and different things. But... Uh, the verse here will reference 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, there's a lot of verses within there that talk about the members and, and uh, the, the, the picture of the body of Christ. Uh, the body is one and hath many members. And, of course, uh, we know that our head, the head of the body, is Jesus Christ himself. The pastor is not the head. The deacons aren't the head. Uh, a committee is not the head. There's not a pope. There's not a... Com, uh, outside committee or commission or anything like that, Christ is the head of the church, and we are members of his body. Nothing else is. But And I like this metaphor. It illustrates several things about the structure of the church and about the church itself and our relationship with Christ. One, it emphasizes well is the unity of the body working together. And we've talked about this a bit at times, but, uh, you know, we think about different members of our body the importance of all these different members having to work together to accomplish what the head tells it to accomplish. So even in just something as simple as I'm going to walk over here and pick up my Bible, there's a whole lot of moving parts in a body that goes into that one simple task that my head has told the rest of my body to do. A lot of different commands go out to make sure that I'm able to walk and pick up and, and use the strength needed to not throw it into the ceiling, but just enough to hold it. Uh, it's a lot of unity involved in different parts. And so I love the picture there of the unity of, of, of members working together to accomplish what the head says. The design of the body 
is another great illustration here to do the work of the head. My body, if it works right, is only going to do what my head tells it to do, my brain tells it to do, even if I'm not thinking about it. And my, in, in, in my case, it happens too much. But, uh, you know, breathing is not something we have to think about unless we want to. But either way, the body's still doing the work of the head. And that's a great illustration of how we as a church body, as a body of Christ, you know, we're just, we, we're just receiving orders from Christ himself through God's word, through his leading in various ways, and, uh, and we're doing that work. Uh, I love the illustration as well, the dependency of members upon each other. You know, we do depend on each other in the work of Christ. There is a variety of people with a variety of roles, personalities to match and help us do the thing that God allows us to do, and we rely on each other for that. You know, I, I know I, I'm up here a lot, um, and uh, the, there's not as many people that come up to the front right now uh, as I'm leading music and doing stuff like that, but there's a whole lot of people that go into making a service work, whether it's, whether it's getting together the missionary prayer requests and making sure that, that somebody's going to read a missions letter. Of course, the person actually reading the missionary letter uh, and, the, and the chance that they get to participate, uh, whether it's somebody helping uh, um, the, with the music, playing the piano, whether it be somebody who's just praying for the things that are happening, all of these different things going together to make a service happen. And so some, some parts of the body are more visible and some more we don't see so much but are still working an important role and function and we depend on each other there's no way i would ever want to be to try to run a church without the help of the rest of the body as the pastor even i'm just part of the body i'm not the head i'm just whatever part i am i know i'm not the head of the of the body and i have dependency on the rest of the body as well and it's a good thing and i love the illustration the metaphor uh because of that and then the diversity that accompanies the unity of the body and, and again, we've mentioned this a little bit, but, uh, you know, we're, we are all different. And that's not a bad thing. I, I've, been, I've said this several times, and I'll stand by it. If we had a church full of me, I wouldn't even come to this church if it was all like me. I um, hope you, <laughs> you wouldn't want to either, trust me. Uh, you know, God makes us different on purpose. Now, there's some things that we need to change to, to match the image of Christ, but he's never intended us for us to be exactly the same. There are some people who are able to, to perform a role that they will speak in front of others. There's some people who will have a very background role and, and never get in, into that speaking, or at least not for now. And you never know what God's going to do for you and do in your heart. But there's a reason why there's diversity, because we need all these different things to come together, whether it be cleaning a bathroom, cleaning the carpets, whether it be organizing a closet uh, that will help a teacher uh, to, be, to be ready uh, and be more efficient in their teaching. You know, any, any kind of role you can think of, we need that diversity or a body doesn't work. And the Bible, and in this passage, illustrates it well. What would the body be if it were all hearing? What would the body be if it were all seeing? We couldn't accomplish. Say, well, you know, the eye is a beautiful thing. I, I want to be the eye, you know. And, and uh, this is the Bible illustration. People, you know, the, the ear looks at the eye and says, well, I'd rather be the eye because it has that beautiful color and, and all I have is wax and nobody likes me and, well, what would we be if we were all eyes? We would see a lot, but we wouldn't hear a thing. We, we need that diversity. And I love the picture of the body for that and something we can look to. So the body is what the first metaphor we look at here. Second one is that the Bible refers to the church as the household of God. The household of God. Ephesians 2.19 uses that phrase. The church is a family. We are a family, the family of God. But uh, and more specific than this, before we start thinking about crazy uncles and people that we'd rather not know that they're in our family at all, we're talking about a household. So think fathers, mother, children, immediate family type household situation. That's the closeness that, that this metaphor represents for us. The closeness of the family of God. We are a family. I, I hope you recognize that. Um, we are bought by the blood of Christ. We are redeemed into his own. We, are, we have become the sons and the daughters of, of God, adopted children, joint heirs with Christ. That makes us immediate family with God and with each other. Uh, that is a bond that we ought to emphasize. I know that sometimes we emphasize 
the, the human blood family as the most important thing. And uh, I, I just think we need to emphasize more this, this Christ's blood family that we are to each other. And it's, e- it's been easier for me to, to, to live that, I think, than some people who has a really close big family. I don't, I've never had a really close big family, very close to my parents, very close to my brother. Um, and and af- as, after Rebecca and I got married, close to her family as well, and I've learned some things. But, uh, but I've always, in my family growing up, we had church family gatherings. We got together with, with church family a lot because uh, we, it was a lot of Navy families, and so they didn't have their family nearby and their blood family, and we didn't really either, and, and so we got close like that. So it's easier for me in that sense. And I know some people have large families, and, and, and you all have some great things there. But we have a very large, wonderful church family redeemed by the blood of Christ, bought together, brought as sons of God and daughters of God. We are this wonderful organization. And I love that it's the household of God. That, that Again, that, that close family. And it, it really illustrates to us how we ought to treat and regard one another. You know, those of you who have the large families, the, the, you know, the human blood-born families, um, that makes it sound like a disease, a blood-borne disease. It's not. I think it's a great thing. I'm not, denounced, I'm not, den- I'm not trying to tear that down at all. But um, you, you guys understand well how to treat and regard each other. I hope uh, close families do this. We, that household of God really ought to teach us that closeness. Well, we don't always get along. I don't know about you guys. If you all had siblings, did you always get along with your siblings? Everything was just hokey-dokey all the time. Yeah, yeah, me neither. My brother is mean. Four years older than me. He used to beat me up all the time. No, he, he's a good brother. At least he beat me up, but he was the only one that was allowed to. Nobody else was allowed to, so that helped a lot. Because I was this dorky little kid running around like I, I didn't weigh anything. You could blow me down and with, when you're blowing out your birthday candles and all that good stuff. But uh, so, you know, obviously you don't always, maybe you don't always get along. But there's still a closeness that you wouldn't, that you wouldn't give up. And, uh, you know, he's family. She's family. And uh, that's how we ought to treat each other. That's how we ought to regard each other. And this illustration teaches us that well. Uh, uh, also, the equality of value in all members of the household. Parents, y'all should understand this well, and I hope you, you know, of course, this is a family that's following after what God would have for us. Uh, Your kids are different. Some of them are better to you than than the others. I was the good son, and and I'm just going to put that out there. Uh, No, you know, there's differences, and some are just more agreeable, but you don't love in different values. There's a there's a shared value there. All you know, you love your kids. And you're like, well, I love this kid. Or maybe today I love this kid. Uh, there's a quality of value, and 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 within with you know uh, husband and wife as well. It's 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 there's a closeness there, and there's and, and that's a great illustration. It's you know we've got different people in within the body of Christ. Some who stand out more than others, but in God's eyes, He looks at us as His household, His 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 own. And he's not assigning values. There's no more assigned value to the pastor of a church than to the janitor of a church. I hate putting the janitor as the lowest level all the time. We're going to stop picking on my dad there. Uh, but, but uh, you know, the, it's, there's a quality of value, and I love that picture there. And then the structure of Christ to his church. Of course, you can't forget Christ used the family, specifically the husband-wife relationship, as the picture of, of Christ and his church. And uh, that's a beautiful picture that he's, that he's given to us there. Uh, he is the husband coming for his bride. We are the bride waiting for, for Christ to return. Um, and you can read about the, the relationship there. Uh, as as uh, Christ loved the church, so should the husband love his wife. And, and uh, as, as the church submits to Christ, so the, the wife submits to the husband. And uh, just a beautiful picture there. So the household of God is the second. And then the third and final of the notes here tonight, the building of God. The building of God. Ephesians 2, 20 and 21 mentions in whom all the building fitly framed together. This is, again, a reference to the church as the building of God and the structure. Now, the church is not, the, you know, the, this building of 3301 Thomas Street is not Calvary Baptist Church. The people are. But we are a building to God as a people. 
It's a great illustration. Jesus Christ is the foundation, and we are built upon him. And, uh, and so it's a great picture, again, understanding that Christ being the foundation of the church, and we're just built on, on him as a structure would be built. And there's really nothing more... Well, other things can knock a building down. But there's few things more important, and really nothing more important, I guess we could say, because everything's stuck than the foundation of a building. If you, don't, if you have a faulty foundation... Anything you build on top, it's not going to matter. The foundation is going to have a prob- give a problem to that building at some point. And, uh, and so you know, this is a great illustration of how important Christ is in the church. This metaphor illustrates the value of the parts when assembled. Now, uh, if you think about a building material, which is quite expensive these days, if you've made a trip down to Home Depot or Lowe's anytime recently, you've seen that prices of building parts have gone skyrocketed three, four, five times what they should be. And uh, it's just pretty crazy. Uh, it's, it's calmed down a little bit, but it's still pretty bad. Um, but even still, the value of all those parts don't add up to the value of the completed structure. You know, the, the, you could buy all the, the two-by-fours and the plywood and sheetrock and everything else that goes into a building, and you'll spend a lot of money doing that. But when you assemble it into a home, it's worth more than the parts themselves. I love that illustration with the church. You know, uh, a, a door isn't as valuable or as helpful to a building unless it's assembled into the building. So if they took that door off and just laid it on the floor, wouldn't mean a lot to us except as a tripping hazard. We wouldn't really care to have it there. But when it's put as it ought to be, it's valuable, it's helpful, it's, it's, it serves a purpose. And so the value of the parts when assembled See, a church isn't so valuable if its members don't assemble. It doesn't really help us a lot to have membership and to have a, a, the structure unless the structure comes together to do the work that God's led us to do. So this metaphor teaches the value of the parts when assembled. Also, the dependency of the structure on its cornerstone. Now, Jesus is specifically referred to as the cornerstone of a building. And the cornerstone is set first in these buildings, in this, in this type of structure, and everything is based off of that placement of the cornerstone. Everything is measured off of or set in order by that cornerstone. The cornerstone is the important part of a building. It's the start of a structure of this type. And uh, I don't know, there's not really a corner. Is there a cornerstone type thing today, Dad? Not really so much. you got to start from one point. And you got to pull off of one point to make sure everything stays. And so, so, so not a literal stone, but something to pull off of. And that's really, that's what Christ is to the church. How do we know we're in the right place? How do we know we're building properly? We're pulling off the cornerstone. We're, we're making sure things line up properly with that starting point. And so a great illustration for the dependency of the structure on that cornerstone. Also the necessity to be fitly framed. That word fitly, when you see it in the Bible, often refers to properly or, or uh, um, as fitting for whatever it is, uh, appropriately, if you, if you will. And so the Bible is up there in Ephesians 2.20, we see in whom all the building fitly framed together. And it's necessary that we are indeed fitly framed. If we're not put together properly as it hath pleased God, then uh, the structure does not do as it ought to. Some buildings are designed for certain things and can handle that, but if you try to, to frame it otherwise, there's a famous example that is in our area. There's a local church, which I won't name, uh, that decided they wanted to have a, uh, a vaulted ceiling. They wanted to have cathedral ceilings, and so we we, we have a we have a uh, A-frame roof. What if we wanted to just go up to that A-frame and man, we'd have this really cool high ceiling? Well, if the structure is not fitly framed, it's not designed for it. It would happen to us. What happened to them? The, eventually, the walls will push out. And the roof will collapse. Bad things will happen. And there's a necessity for a building to be fitly framed for what it's designed to do. And this, this metaphor of, of understanding that God has designed us in that way to join together to do as he's called us. But if we try to go outside of our design, we're going to cause problems. It's a perfect metaphor to help us understand the necessity to be fitly framed. And then, of course, there's a visual of a proper structure as a testament of God. Once the building is assembled, 
once the parts are put together, there's an impressive structure for the world to see. Not impressive because we're impressive as individual members, but impressive because of what God built. If you've ever seen a building being built, and they start and they gather a bunch of materials and you see piles of, of, of lumber and piles of, of uh, plywood and, and just different things all brought together, piles of cement or a big cement truck or whatever, and all these things brought together. They're going to start building. Not very impressive to see piles of things around. That's the individual parts of the building. But man, once they assemble the structure, once they get those parts in the right spot and fitly frame it all together, it's pretty impressive to see what can be done, to see what can be built. And so we are the different members that God, as we saw in our theme verse, has, has put together in such a way that pleaseth him. We are those members that on our own, it's not very impressive just to see, but when Christ puts things together as he sees fit, when God builds the church that he will build, it's, a, it's an impressive testimony before the Lord of what God can do. And we can point to Christ. And the, the idea that we are the building of God set in the world to be this, this lighthouse for him, it, it is an impressive thought of what Christ can do, and it glorifies God. And, uh, and so this is just another thing that the building of God illustrates. Uh, this brings us to the end of the lesson. Those three metaphors, of course, the building of God, the body of Christ, and the, uh, what was the third one? The household of God, thank you. All showing what different aspects of the church, helping us to learn more about what God's design is for the church. But he has definite structure there. There's no question about that. There is structure that Christ has put together in his church, and it's important. It's important to follow the way that Christ sets things up, and we want to do that. We want to, we want to, we want to follow Christ, and, and uh, that commitment is important. The fidelity is important within membership. And so Christ has set this way up for a reason, and we certainly want to follow his design. Any thoughts or questions or comments uh, before we close here tonight? This is that awkward standing moment. To become a member, what do you need to do is the question. Uh, joining a church, and if, if we're going to follow what the Bible does, um, we've got a called out assembly together. So these are people who would, uh, first of all, be saved and be baptized. We see that every time when it talks about joining a church. They were, they were believed, they were baptized, and then they were added to the church. And, uh, and so there's a little process there. We want to make sure, when, practically speaking, when a person comes that they are uh, in line with what the Bible teaches, that they're going to be uh, um, a kind of fit where uh, there, there won't be a clash of doctrine. Um, and so we make sure that people have been biblically saved, biblically baptized, and they have a heart to want to serve after God and, and be part of that work. And, uh, and so it's, it's uh, in, what, in many sense, it's not a hard process. It's not like you've got to be sponsored by 30 people, you know, although the church will vote. I've never seen anybody vote against, I, mean, I don't know, I haven't seen anybody ever vote against a member. Have you all ever seen somebody? Maybe you shouldn't tell me. Maybe I don't want to know. <laughs> uh, usually you'd see a pastor go, because uh, uh, by that point, of course, they're going to present the church that they've, they've already, the pastor's already met with them. And uh, so you'll see uh, all in favor, raise your hand. All opposed, certainly no opposition. You know, you don't get a chance to raise your hand that way. But yeah, uh, saved, baptized, and heart to serve God is what, we're, is what mem churches look for. All right, good question. Anybody else? Thoughts on that? Questions, comments, concerns, complaints, controversies? I can think of more. Okay. Well, let's pray. Uh, uh, I, just as a public service announcement, uh, do be careful. Uh, tomorrow they're talking about flooding, um, coast, uh, tidal flooding. Um, they said on the news, six foot nine inches. I don't know if that's above normal or what that is, but they reference back to Hurricane Sandy, 2012. It's a little bit higher than those levels. And uh, be a bit windy in as well. So just be careful when you're out driving. Stay off of those roads that flood. For us, it's Bainbridge, but whatever it might be for you. Just be careful as you go out tomorrow. Four o'clock is the high tide in the afternoon. That's supposed to be the worst. So just give you a heads up on that. But All right, well, let's pray, and then we will be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we thank you again, Lord, for bringing us together. God, I thank you for this this called-out assembly, this church, God, that you've brought together. And, Lord, they are, they are such a great family, Lord, and I thank you for them. And that's only because of, of what you've built, God. And we give you the praise and glory for it. And Lord, I pray that you'll bless this church, God. I pray that you will... You will stamp yourself upon us, God, that we will be lights for you, Lord, that 
that we'll want to follow after you and, and, and just be part of what you're doing. And, uh, Lord, we look forward to how you'll build the church, but help us in, as you build the church, Lord, to be in obedience to you and do those things you've called us to do. And, uh, Lord, be a prophet, as we mentioned this morning, being a prophet to our, our neighborhood, to the community, Lord, to, to, to the cause of Christ. And, Lord, just help us to do what you would like us to do, Lord. Bless us as we go our separate ways. I pray that you keep folks safe. And, uh, Lord, just give us uh, uh, just the opportunity that, and uh, the will to come back and meet together again the next time. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your goodness. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.